Hello and welcome. I'm Rob Hirschfeld, CEO, co-founder of RackN, and this is the sixth session of the Cloud 2030 Summit about social access, uh, which didn't turn out exactly as I was expecting. We need to go back and think about what um, it takes to get people equity and, and fair access to these technologies and, and remove barriers for have and have not. We ended up talking a lot about right to use and uh, things like that, which are also important social access things, more tied up in sort of you know people's access to the technology itself um, if you have access. And so we will come back and talk about the social issues. I think that is very important, um, but this is equally important, property rights and what people can do with tech. Enjoy the session. Thanks. All right, how are we getting access to all this stuff, right? How do we make sure that the people who are getting it have access and they understand what the consequences are? I mean, we, we just teased out this sort of question of people are all of a sudden dependent on these core technologies and don't even realize it. Who are the have and have nots in these cases? If, if, you know, if my, if, you know, do we have people who are locked out of technologies Rob, I love together? this question. I talked to uh, uh, now that I'm a small business owner. I talked to yeah. other small business owners. They're not necessarily in technology. Talk to a guy. He has about he has a manufacturing company with about ten to fifteen million dollars a year in revenue, and he said, "You know, Keith, I've been talking, look, looking at your 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 videos. They're super interesting. I can't get any of that capability." I'm like, "Well, you, have you looked at AWS?" And he was like, "Who?" I'm like Amazon <laughs> Web Services, like Amazon Web Services, Amazon has a technology business. So for and us in, not, in our environment, like, yeah, Amazon is a gorilla. But for this small business owner who's who has a substantial business, he's never, ever heard of AWS, let alone what they can do from a call center and all these other business services that they have that he could uh, acquire. Who is it on? And this goes to Keith's earlier point as technologists. Should we now become analysts and serve the, the this locked out community? Is this are is AWS even geared towards selling towards a small business like that? I I, I don't know the answers to any of that. No. No. And and I think one of the questions, and this kind of goes back to my time at All Covered when I was CIO for All Covered um, that served SMBs. There's a real question as to how much an SMB should really get involved into that layer of depth. I mean, should they really be developing applications on AWS? Again, I think the, the answer to that holds true as an enterprise, which is if it's incredibly differentiating and they can't leverage a service to be able to do it, and it is core to their IP, then maybe. But short of that, if they can buy a service and that's more efficient for them so they can focus their energy in other spaces. I mean, Keith, go back to, you know, what many of us on this call, just kind of looking around the, the pictures, many of us would be doing, I mean, do we run our own email servers still? Do we run a lot of our own, you know, web servers and infrastructure? Why not? We can, we probably ha still have the technical astuteness to be able to do so. I know I'll speak for myself, I've probably lost that in, in recent years. But my point is, at some point you have to ask yourself, what's the most valuable use of your time? And as a business owner, whether you're an enterprise or an SMB, you should be asking that same question. And what, where does technology fit into that answer? And that should be the guidance that we're providing to folks. But getting back to what Sean was saying about maybe it's too far afield in government and legislation. I'm a strong believer when it comes to technology, legislation should be as far out as possible that we need to take more ownership from a business standpoint around how we manage it and how we manage data and doing the right thing. If legislation does come into play, and this is actually where a number of vendors are playing because I'm involved in a number of vendors, um, legislative educational efforts, where they're educating uh, folks on the Hill. And I'll say that they are trying to take a similar stance where they're trying to avoid legislation coming in, partly because self-servingly it, it hurts their business, right? It constrains them. But the other piece is if we can leave it unlegislated and let the free market actually take it forward and do the right thing when it comes to data, that's better for everybody all around. 
But if that goes too far afield, and I think social media is prime, a prime example of where I think we're going to see some more legislation conversation come into play, especially after the recent events, um, there's going to be a real question about where it comes in and how it comes in. And those should be two different conversations. Yeah, but I, I think, I, I mean, your point is well taken, but I think uh, part of the problem is that um, some of these services um, have become so commoditized, Facebook as an example, um, or search as another, um, that, and the, um, the organizations running these commoditized services have become uh, so dominant uh, partially because they've been so successful because they've been good at their job. Um, in some cases, uh, becoming more frequent, um, they've also become rather successful at dominating by acquisition or by shutting out competition, um, that it becomes necessary for somebody to step in to level the playing field. Um, if I am a, as an example, if I have a an idea to build a competitor to AdWords, and I'm going to go to VC and try to get funding for that. Um, they're, I'm, gonna, I'm not even going to get a meeting, much less you know get laughed out unless I have a ton of customers and a ton, and the best idea ever already baked in before I meet the VC at all to even get the meeting. So um, it it's oh. it is a problem um, that uh, it's. It, it's a problem that uh, is, uh, it's a good problem to have that information and certain services have become so ubiquitous that um, we just come to rely on them. But it's also now become a problem of what happens when Facebook decides to block me, um, uh, you know, just whether it's on purpose or by accident, who do I go to? Um, how do I get the problem solved if Facebook decides to no longer do business with my business that's dependent on them? If we don't have a right to have, to create a create have create innovation and create our own company, that's not in capitalism. That's not predetermined. We always think that innovation is great and everyone should be able to start their own company. That's not that's not that's not required. People, I mean, people. We say we like that. That's important, but. It's not necessary. It's not necessary in every part of the economy. Um, and I think that people have, we should remember that. And sometimes, every once in a while, it's more efficient to have a one, have a dominant company, maybe a dominant company that's regulated, deal with things. And um, that's not. Do we have a right to uh, telephone service? Uh, in the in the United States, we do. Okay. Well, I don't, that's, that's the that's thing. I think example. legislatively, we do. I mean, not, I think, not by God, given by God. I, I, think, we're, I, think, we're wow. missing, I think we're missing a few key points, folks, uh, relative to um, the industry and regulation. And one is that we cannot allow the free market to decide because these are not nice to haves. Amazon, as an example, regardless of whether you decide you want to run your infrastructure on it or not, is where people go for some of their education, just like Google, et cetera, et cetera, where people go to actually get their work done when they're at home. It is not a nice to have. Um, we, we attempted for years to allow the free market to determine uh, access to internet, and that's been proven over the last year that that's not a successful strategy. So making an assumption that somehow the cloud providers are gonna be these benevolent dictators that own the world five years from now, but we're all gonna be fine, is a nirvana that most folks in Silicon Valley seem to believe still, and, and it is not true. It is already not true for so many small firms that have been eaten alive by these companies. So to think that we should just allow them to go and then assume that we can live under the regulated um, environment that will come when they own 40 or 50 percent of the globe's transactions means that we're setting ourselves up for failure. And, I, and not just the monetary transactions, because I think the percentage of just technical interactions and transactions will probably be a higher number than that. You know, we earlier we talked about the Roombas not having full functionality. 
Well, what about my insulin pump? My IoT connected insulin pump works fine in Chicago. But when I go to visit family in Alabama and I go for a run in Alabama, am I going to, is it going to fall underneath? Uh, is my blood sugar going to fall underneath uh, the, the whatever? The, this is a real problem for me. And I go running, I'm in a rural area and uh, legally Amazon or the services built on Amazon isn't obligated to make sure that I get the SLAs I need for my insulin pump or insert medical device or any other IOT thing that's gonna be built and gonna make my life overall better, but at risk to my life. So here, here in, in IOT space, right? The, any medical device is subject to the FDA regulation. So, you know, medical device, it's a broad term. You could think of medical devices doing pure diagnostics versus medical devices that are doing therapeutics. So your glucometer, your IOT connected glucometer, um, that would be under the FDA regulated medical device that actually is a therapeutic, right? It's responsible for insulin release, et cetera, et cetera. And it does come with disclaimers. It does say, you know, if I don't have ubiquitous connectivity, if this is not the performance that I'm uh, looking at, it will alert you. Now, if it's not the case, then FDA doesn't pass it. So, you know, the broader med device term um, you know, there are, there are classifications within the FDA acceptance of the medical device, right? So is it just an IoT connected thermometer that is just doing diagnosis or, you know, just taking a look at the temperature reading? Um, or is it actually responsible for your insulin release? Um, so, you know, good, valid concerns, but there are certain guardrails that are built in the legislation that you don't do away with. So there is a room for sensible legislation, but you know, there are certain things that you generally want a very light touch from regulation because, it, you know, large companies like Facebook, Google, they can afford regulatory burdens. Um, but mm. there is this notion of technology that built the infrastructure that they put in place, regulatory capture. Many people conflate that with the ills of, um, you know, rather than talking about uh, blaming, they, they blame capitalism, um, but it's actually regulatory capture and large behemoth companies can afford the cost of regulation. Um, there's a good you know, example. <laughs> uh, sorry to interrupt. There's a good example of um, uh, EU legislation, GDPR. Um, it, for In some industries, it's effectively locked out everyone, but Facebook, Google, and a few, and a few of the larger banks. Because Absolutely. Nobody else can comply. It's way too complicated and difficult. Absolutely. I love that you brought up the example of the FDA and that there's room. I'm, I'm not a huge regulatory fan in general, but I also free uh, uh, unencumbered free market is also a bad thing. Going back to the glucose monitor, dumb device. I have this little you guys, if you know anybody with diabetes has this, you know, one touch machine collects data for the, you know, stem stick picks. Went into the pharmacy last year, went to go renew the 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 prescription for the things. The insurance company said, no, you can't use that model anymore. You have to upgrade to the last model. I'm getting older in age. So I have 10 years of data in this device. So this goes to data and the and, and I think the applicability of regulations. I have 10 years of data in this device. I have to start all over in a new device and there's not an easy way for me to extract the data from one device to go to the next device. And there's no FDA regulation that says that the, the manufacturer has to do it. As a technologist, I'll get it done. My 74 year old mom, not so much. So where this and across other touch points, where 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 do we want the government to uh, touch and, and not? And looking at the debates the past few days, I don't know if I trust these guys and gals to make those decisions for me. Um, I guess to me, what I'm hearing is everyone agrees that there should be some regulatory involvement, but a robust, well-designed regulatory framework is not the enemy of capitalism. The enemy of capitalism is the fact that we, in our desire to be capitalists, we allow the industry 
to write the regulatory framework. And so what they end up doing is creating runways for larger enterprises to be able to afford the regulation, squeezing out competition. So they're using regulatory frameworks to squeeze out or prevent our barriers of entry for startups who may be solving the problem that keeps having with the data transfer from one system to a new device, right? There may be a company out there that would love to solve that problem, but the big manufacturer that has a competitive advantage and the desire to keep everyone stat, uh, onto their system prevents them by you leveraging the regulatory framework. So I think to a certain extent, I don't, you know, I talk about Adam Smith and I talk about the fact that we adopted one version of the book and not both versions of the book. I go back to this concept of unfeathered capitalism is an enemy of good society. Just as no, but, unfeathered regulatory framework is the enemy of, 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 of good society, there needs to be a recognition that the government's job is to be an independent arbiter of what is fair and right for the citizens that they work for, as opposed to this, this amorphous large organization who is trying to be the balancer between the market and the consumer. I want a government that is all about the consumer. Let the market be about the market. And I think stuff that Sean is getting to where you have a concern about regulatory um, overreaching and preventing innovation and preventing companies from performing, that would solve that problem. The question is, the problem is we will let government step outside of their domain. They're no longer protecting the consumer. They now became an instrument of the capitalist society. No, it's, it's not, I think we're going to get too much into politics here, but I mean, this is very philosophical. If we, I mean, Keith, I agree with a lot of what you said, but <laughs> no, but what, what, what Keith is saying, that, that does happen, right? This is canonically yeah. what the term right. regulatory capture means. The point is, if you want to actually have sensible legislation, then uh, you know, we have to start deprecating the use of special interest groups, right? Uh, lobbying groups, again, right? People who can afford them are the behemoths. They are the Googles, the Amazons that are writing a lot of this regula regulation as well. As 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 a as a as a reply, we, you know, when people start talking about, hey, you know, we need some some kind of democratization of data, et cetera, then yes, you know, Facebooks and Googles can come up there and say, well, this is the regulation you need that puts a check on us. But the point is, the regulation is so freaking lofty those goals that only those companies can afford them. GDPR is one example, but you know, similar privacy uh, regulations were always keeping other companies out. Uh, prior to GDPR, it was, you know, the safe harbor law that became the EU US privacy law uh, now and you know it's it's GDPR. Um, but in that sense, the CCPA that talks about the privacy regulation within the US, that's much more palatable to me over GDPR. Um, but again, you know, it's it's a where do you actually need regulation and where you're actually building it under the false premise of checking, guarding the controls of the big monopolies, where it ends up being just a barrier uh, to the smaller players coming in. I'll give you a generic solution. Um, so um, in, I have some ideas on uh, implementations of this, but I'll keep, I'll, I won't go into it because we don't have a lot of time. We can talk about it offline or in a future discussion, but um, uh, putting in as a baseline that permissionless innovation is uh, essentially a fundamental right of every consumer um, is something that we've never actually had. Um, so much to Mr. Townsend's early example of an insulin pump, um, there are certain businesses and maybe not that one's a great example, but there have been, uh, in, well, actually cars right now. Um, there's some car manufacturers that are uh, interested in experimenting with the idea of not allowing you to tinker with certain parts of your car, where it comes to data gathering, you as a consumer do not have the right and actually could get sued by the auto manufacturer if you try to get access to the data they're collecting. Um, so <clears throat> me as a consumer of that car, I fundamentally disagree with that because I own it. 
the, the car manufacturer no longer has any responsibility other than the warranty that, you know, the contractual agreement <clears throat> I got into. Um, but there are certain industries that are dominant that would like nothing better to lock the consumer out from being able to innovate with their products and to build new things and to build possibly new businesses. Um, and they, they want to capture that business. So um, the side effect, the GDPR, I think it was, I think that you had all the right intentions and then uh, much to others um, examples here that they allowed the lobbyists, the big firms to get involved with helping to write the legislation and they totally manipulated the EU legislatures and uh, legislators into writing something that only they could essentially um, adopt, thus locking out the competition and locking out innovation. This is, a, 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 again, you know, put a, a classic, a, a, an actual real world example, 2008, when we were building the object store and um, John, this was not a NetApp, I was at EMC. Um, one of our primary clients, the first clients was Deutsche Telekom. And that time it was Safe Harbor Laws. And when they started talking about Safe Harbor Laws, bringing in a different client that had multiple caching data centers, residence um, data centers, when they would start talking about where the, the data centers itself would be, um, we added the functionality um, of geo-restricting where the replicas could be based on countries. But how many other companies could actually do that, right? How many other companies could on the fly in under a quarter enable that feature set, essentially help build the policy framework, the regulation framework, and adapt to it to end up serving a client and customer? I mean, unless you were a market leader in the storage space, which EMC was in 2008, you couldn't pull that off. And you are the ones that are actually influencing what the regulation is. This is classically what is known as regulatory capture, right? So you can't blame capital on it. You just have to be able to say that, no, you know, a lot of these motivations on how these regulations are being written, they're being extremely highly influenced by the market leaders. Well, and so, that a lot of that comes back to the fact that there's a degree of, of ignorance. And I don't mean ignorance in terms of stupidity. I mean, ignorance in terms of just not understanding the ramifications and the complexity of it. Um, but as, and I've mentioned this in the chat, but as data becomes more prevalent and every single company on the planet is building a profile about the users of their products and services, whether it's profile information to understand who Tim Crawford is, or whether it's uh, behavioral information to know how Tim Crawford drives his car. Um, they are building profiles of information around people. I think that the challenge comes in kind of to the question around uh, owning of data. I, I'm not so sure about that. At first I thought, yes, we should absolutely own our data. I'm not so sure that, that we should. And the reason I say that is because there's a difference between owning and licensing data and how it gets used. There's also a trust that comes around data. And I'm not sure that the vast majority of people, and I would say the vast majority with few exceptions, um, really understand how to manage their own data in an effective way. You know, whether we're talking about more sensitive data like health data, or we're talking about behavioral data around just how can I run my vehicle more efficiently? I mean, the, Data is not data is not data. And I know, you know, Rich, this is something that you spend just gobs of time around, right? You live and breathe this. But I'm not so sure that I want legislative action uh, from a body of legislators that have a superficial understanding of the complexities of this at best to be stepping into this space, maybe down the road maybe down the road, you know, to prevent us from going sideways. But today, no. In the next few years, no. Um, I think yeah. there are other ways to be able to manage this. Uh, I'm sorry to close this down, but there is more good things to come. We, we went around the table and gave closing thoughts about the day, uh, and they were really fantastic. People really stepped back and thought about what was going. So, you know, if you've been cruising through these other sections, that one will help bring it back together uh, and help you sort of pull the voices together. And as always, if you want to see who's doing what talking, check the video out. Uh, that can help you identify faces and voices. If somebody was especially evocative to you or pissed you off, um, you, you will be able to put the face and voice together 
uh, and get a name out of it. Once again, I hope you've enjoyed these sessions. Please tune in for the outro or for our ongoing session at the 2030.cloud. And thanks.